but uh, the church at Smyrna. <clears throat> Someone asked C.S. Lewis, and I know you've heard of, of him. Someone asked C.S. Lewis once, why do the righteous suffer? And his response was this, why not, he replied, they're the only ones who can take it. Interesting. Um, <clears throat> Martin Luther, the, uh, the guy that nailed those 95 theses to the wall of the Catholic Church a few hundred years ago, Martin Luther said this, if we consider the greatness and the glory of the life we shall have when we have risen from the dead, it would not be difficult at all for us to bear the concerns of this world. If I believe the word, I shall on the last day, after the sentence has been pronounced, not only gladly have suffered ordinary temptations, insults, and imprisonment, but I shall also say, Oh, that I did not throw myself under the feet of all the godless for the sake of the great glory which I now see revealed and which has come to me through the merit of Christ. What a, what a perspective, right? Martin Luther is saying, you know, we go through some tough times down here, but when we get to that moment, that day, when we stand before God, we're going to go, well, you know, why didn't we do more? Uh, the background on Smyrna as a city, as a community, about 700 years before John penned this letter to uh, the church at Smyrna, the old city, old Smyrna, had been destroyed. And it had lay in ruins for about 300 years or so. But the city of John's time had, quote, risen from the dead. I mean, you know, a city that was and then wasn't. And then after 300 years or so, they rebuild, kind of like bringing it back from the dead. I say that metaphorically because of the message that Christ has for this church in the community and city of Smyrna. Smyrna thrives even today. Uh, today it's known as Izmir, that's I-Z-M-I-R, and that is the second largest city in Turkey. And resurrection to be the experience of the church is kind of the metaphor here. Uh, Herschel Hobbes gives us some more details, background on Smyrna before we read the scripture. Smyrna was located due north of Ephesus on a gulf of the Aegean Sea and from the beginning of Roman expansion it was a faithful ally of Rome. Cicero wrote of Smyrna as the city of our most faithful and most ancient allies and at this time it had been such for about three centuries so it was one of the strong centers of emperor worship okay just realize that in Smyrna uh, there was a stronghold of emperor worship and there was a temple to Tiberius located there. It had a strong Jewish population as well. And these two, these two things, emperor worship and a strong Jewish population, resulted in the persecu persecution of Christians. Now, let's go to the scriptures and let's look at what Jesus has to say to the church at Smyrna. In Revelation 2 verse 8, <clears throat> Jesus says, Write to the angel of the church in Smyrna, thus says the first and the last, the one who was dead and came to life, I know your affliction and poverty, but you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. Look, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison to test you, and you will experience affliction for ten days. Be faithful to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will never be harmed by the second death. Really a short passage tonight. But boy, is it full of meaning. You see, Smyrna is only one of two churches out of these seven that uh, Christ encourages and does not rebuke. Okay, He finds something wrong in five of the seven churches, uh, but in Smyrna, he does not rebuke them for anything. He simply says, don't be afraid 
of what you're about to suffer. Um, Smyrna faced serious persecution, including the possibility of death. And our Lord Jesus Christ assured the church that he had overcome and that he was victorious over death. That's why he, he points to himself in verse 8 as the first and the last, which is a name used in Isaiah, uh, the prophet, to refer to God. So, you know, he's claiming deity. And he refers to himself as the one who was dead and came to life. Okay? And uh, that, that res would resonate with Smyrna in so many ways. It would resonate with their history because their city had died. And after three centuries, it came back. And also it would resonate in the immediate situation because many of them were going to be persecuted. Some would possibly even die for Christ. But they had the hope of life beyond the grave because Jesus did, right? And so that's kind of the expectation there. Um, one, uh, one Bible commentator says this. He says, although the apostles often were welcomed initially by the Jewish communities that were scattered, in one city after another, their message of a crucified Messiah and his welcome to pagans apart from circumcision led to expulsion from the synagogue. Now let me say that again because you've got to understand that. Uh, although the apostles were welcomed initially, by Jewish communities when they were scattered during the dispersion. In one city after another, their message of a crucified Messiah and his welcoming pagans apart from circumcision led to expulsion from the synagogue. And in a culture that prized social stability and viewed new religious movements as political threats, Christians pushed out from the umbrella of Judaism they would be exposed to suspicion from neighbors and intimidation by local officials. And that's exactly what happened. Another commentator said, non-Christian Jews, okay, Jews that refuse to believe and recognize Jesus as Messiah, non-Christian Jews may have been trying to get Christians in trouble by claiming that the church was not a Jewish sect, but essentially a non-Jewish group. Look at all those Gentiles joining their, their cause, okay? If so, in the eyes of the Roman government, they could, like all Gentiles, be required to show political loyalty to the government by participating in emperor worship. Did you catch that? In other words, we have a dilemma here. We have these followers of the way, these followers of Jesus. And remember in Acts 15, they had to go to Jerusalem and they had to settle how do Gentiles, how are they saved? Do they have to become Jews to be saved? Do they have to be circumcised on top of Jesus, you know? And, and no, no, they settled that once for all. No, they don't have to do that at all. Salvation is through Jesus alone, period. And that was settled. And the church began to move forward. And, and the gospel began to go and break through all the boundaries, right? And yet, here in Smyrna, you've got emperor worship on one hand. And you've got unbelieving Jews on the other. And unbelieving Jews are going to call out the Christians and say, hey, they don't deserve the legal protection that we have because they're not, they're not anything to do with Judaism. They're not even a sect. They're, they're their own movement. They're their own cause. And that took them out from under the umbrella of Judaism. And then they would be exposed to the demands of the Roman Empire and they would have to deal with emperor worship. If they refused, as Christians we must, we don't worship man, we worship God, then they could be executed for treason. And that was the situation, that was the dilemma, okay, that the believers of Christ in Smyrna found themselves. And that's why Jesus uses the phrase, the terminology, synagogue of Satan. Now, Let's be honest. We do think high of the Jewish people. I do as a follower of Jesus. I am thankful for the nation of Israel. Okay, They are God's people in the Old Testament. Through them we have the patriarchs and the prophets and ultimately Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Okay, However, this is Jesus himself speaking, talking to the church, and he's basically saying those unbelieving Jews that are persecuting the church 
and opposing me, they are a synagogue of Satan. Now, that's Jesus, not me. I'm just giving you the message here. So look, if you will, in Revelation 2, 9. Jesus says to the church, I know your affliction and poverty, but you are rich. Now, if you were an outsider and you went to Smyrna and you observed their congregation of believers, you'd say, man, they've been through some tough times. They've struggled. They've been through hardships and affliction and suffering. And they're, they're, they're poor. They have poverty. But if you looked at them the way Christ does, he says you are rich. Because even though you have needs, you're depending on me. And God has an endless supply. Okay, he, he, he can meet all of our needs. And then he says, Christ says this in verse 9, I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Now, please understand what Jesus is saying. He's talking about people that pretend to be Jews, that claim to be Jews, but they're really not. And that begs the question, really, what is a Jew? And I believe Paul answered that question in Romans. We may look at that sometime, but that's where you would find the answer. Uh, here's a quote from Herschel Hobbes. I love the way he explains it. He says, what this blasphemy, you know, this, this slander or, or blasphemy, what it was, we're not told. It may be, okay, here's a plausible option. It may be that the Jews were taunting the Christians for leaving the Jewish faith. Judaism was a legal religion. Uh, it was a recognized religion by the Roman government, and it was legal to belong to it, and there were certain protections that they had. Much like today in our country, uh, churches have certain protection in the eyes of the government, right? Uh, we still have free speech. We still have the right to assemble and worship. Uh, even legally, we have, uh, what, a nonprofit status and, and, and things like that. Um, so Judaism was a legal religion in the eyes of the Roman government, and it was legal to belong to it. And uh, at the outset of Christianity, it was regarded by the Romans as part of Judaism. That's, they just saw it as connected to that. But when it became evident that it was a different thing, then the cloak of legality was removed, and so Christians became subject to persecution by the Roman Empire, the Roman government. And Herschel Hobbes says, perhaps this is just a plausible theory to explain what's going on underneath the surface and behind the scenes. He says, perhaps the Jews, the unbelieving Jews here, were deriding the Christians, saying that their departure from the true faith of Judaism was bringing upon them God's judgment. And possibly they were also telling them to renounce Christ, to return to Judaism, and to escape persecution. And quite frankly, I think he's right. Because when you read the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, what does the writer, the human author, say to his Hebrew audience? He says, listen... Do not trample under your foot the Son of God and treat the holy blood of the covenant as an, as an unworthy thing, okay? When, when God made that first covenant on Mount Sinai, it was a fearful thing. But now we have God sending His Son from heaven. Who wants to fall into the hands of that living God, okay? That's a paraphrase, but if you read Hebrews, that's, that's the argument that He makes, is that when you come to Christ, Christ is greater than Moses, he's greater than the tabernacle, he, he fulfilled the law, he's greater than the priesthood, he's greater, he's greater than everything, and in Christ, in Christ alone, can we be saved. The blood of bulls and, and goats and heifers and all that could never take away sin. That's why the high priest had to offer sacrifices again and again, year after year, over and over, but Christ came, and what did he do? He died once for all time. Isn't that right? And now we have the blood that speaks a better word than Abel. We have a new covenant built on better promises. That's what Hebrews says in the New Testament. And so it's very plausible that the unbelieving Jews, and I want to make sure you understand who I'm talking about, the unbelieving Jews that clearly opposed 
believers of Christ and persecuted them. Perhaps they were saying, you departed from the true way. Now you're getting God's judgment and you need to renounce Christ and come back to Judaism and then you will be protected by the government of Rome and you won't be persecuted. And you know what Paul said, may I boast in Christ and never be circumcised because they just want to boast in my flesh. And may I boast in Christ and Him alone. That's Galatians chapter 6. And speaking of Galatians, turn if you will to Galatians 4. Now, if we're honest, when we look at what does the Bible teach about Israel, there's a lot that it says. Some of it's good and some of it's bad, and if we're honest, we've got to look at the good and the bad and the ugly, okay? Now, let me set this up this way. Paul loved the Israel people, and in Romans 10, I believe, he said that he wished he could forfeit. Now, this is a paraphrase. Paul wished he could forfeit his salvation if he could see his own people, the Jewish people, saved. Okay, that was his desire. That was his heartbeat. Okay, and even though Paul was known as the apostle to the Gentiles, whenever he went to a new community, you know where he went first? He went to the synagogue. Because Paul wrote in his letters that salvation is for the Jew first and then the Gentile. So Paul made it a practice in his mission strategy to always take the gospel when he went to a new place to go to the Jews first. And then if they rejected the gospel, he washed his hands, he took the dust off his feet, and he says, fine, I'm going to the Gentiles. And you'll see that in the book of Acts, and boy, did it make him mad. But in Romans, he reveals the wisdom of God. He says God is using the disobedience of the Jews in order to reach the Gentiles for Christ. And then when he reaches the Gentiles for Christ, he's using that to make the Jews jealous so that some of them might be saved as well. And that's in Romans, I think, 11. And, and after he explains all that, then the doxology that we always see. You always probably wondered what prompted that doxology. When you realize that God wins no matter what happens, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to go out there and die for the sins of the world, and these won't get it, and these won't get it, but when these reject me, that means these will have an opportunity, and when they have an opportunity, these will get jealous, and some of them will still get saved. God, God, you see how God works? It's amazing. It's, it's really amazing. But when you get to Galatians 4, Paul gives us a little bit more insight and understanding as to why there's friction between the unbelieving Jewish people and Christians, okay? I'm going to read the scriptures in Galatians 4, verses 21 through 29, and this is just a plain reading of scripture. Accept it as it's written and hear what it says. In Galatians 4, 21, here's what Paul says. Paul says, tell me, you who want to be under the law... Don't you hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave and the other by a free woman. Now he's talking about Ishmael, who he had through a slave named Hagar from Egypt. Uh, from Egypt. And then he's talking about the promised one, Isaac, that he had through his wife Sarah. Right? Just making sure we're clear on that. In verse 23, the one by the slave was born as a result of the flesh, while the one by the free woman was born through promise. Now you get that, right? All right, <clears throat> let's keep reading. These things are being taken figuratively, for the women represent two covenants. Now I'm glad Paul said that, because as I went out there and said this is a figurative thing, y'all go, oh, uh oh, you're making that up. Paul is using this to illustrate something for us. And Paul is telling us how to look at it. In verse 24, Paul says, These two women, Hag Hagar and Sarah, who had sons, one was born of the flesh, and the other one was born through promise. You might say, how was one born through promise? Because Abraham was 100 years old, Sarah was 90. She could not have kids, and at 90, do you know anybody at 90 that has kids? But God had promised Abraham 
that he would have a son. It would come through him. And a year before Isaac was born, he visited Abraham and he said, and it's going to be through your wife, Sarah. And remember, she was in the tent and she said, oh, Oh, well, after all these years, will my Lord give me the pleasure to bear him a son? And she laughed, right? That's in Genesis. And then God says, did she laugh? And she gets scared and goes, no, I didn't laugh. And then God says, oh, yes, you did. And if you know the rest of the story in Genesis, you'll know that a year later, Sarah was pregnant and had a son, and she named him Isaac. And do you know what the name Isaac means? It means laughter. God had the last laugh. Well, anyway, let's read this part again, verse 24. These things, these two women with two sons, are being taken figuratively, for the women represent two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, and it bears children into slavery, and that's Hagar. Now, Hagar represents Mount Sinai in Arabia, and it corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. Leave it to Paul to figure this out and write it in Scripture. Paul is saying that today, in his day and in ours, current Jerusalem, okay, is in slavery with her children. They've tried to establish a righteousness on their own, through obeying the law based on their own effort. And guess what? It's not enough. It's not enough. Then, what does he say? Verse 26, But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. For it's written, Rejoice, childless woman, unable to give birth. Burst into song and shout, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate woman will be many, more numerous than those of the woman who has a husband. Now you too, brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just as then the child born as a result of the flesh persecuted the one born as a result of the Spirit, so also now. Wow, did you catch that conclusion in verse 28? We are born from above. We are part of the new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, okay? And we're born of the spirit, not of the flesh. We are children of promise. We believe Jesus said you must be born again, and we believe his word, and we're born again, and we now have the promise that God will save us, and he will always be with us. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. And so we're children of promise. And the conclusion in verse 29, according to Paul, just like in Abraham's day, the child born of the flesh, which was Ishmael, he mocked Isaac when he was old enough to be weaned. And Sarah laid down the gauntlet and told Abraham, that boy, he's got to go. He's not going to have any share in the inheritance None whatsoever. And if you read that story in Genesis, it breaks Abraham's heart because he's the father to both of these boys. And he goes to God, and God basically tells Abraham two things. He says, tell him to go. I'll still take care of Hagar, and I'll still take care of Ishmael, and I still have a plan for him. But Isaac's the boy I promised to you. And your wife's right. You need to listen to her. That's what he said. And so here we have this uh, conclusion that the child born as a result of the flesh persecutes the one born as a result of the spirit. And Paul is saying to the Galatian church, that's happening right now. And that shoe fits the church in Smyrna as well. The unbelieving Jews, those that profess to be Jews, but they're really not because they're, they're focused on the flesh, not faith in Jesus. They are slandering God's people, and they're saying, they don't belong to us. They're not, they're not of Judaism. They're, they're of this new movement, and they're not legal. And next thing you know, not only are they getting slandered, not only are, are the members of the Church of Smyrna getting slandered by the Jewish unbelievers in the community, but now they, they're spotlighted for not worshiping the emperor. And now they're in trouble with the government. 
the legal arm over them that has the power to put them in prison and persecute them and even prosecute them and ultimately kill them. That's what's going on in Smyrna. And now when you read Galatians 4, who better than Paul to say that? I mean, seriously, who better than Paul? A Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee of Pharisees, a Jew himself, who persecuted followers of the way and applauded their death when, when Stephen was the very first Christian martyr. And yet God radically saves him on the road to Damascus. And now the same guy that tried to persecute people that believed the faith in Jesus is now being persecuted for proclaiming Christ. And Paul explains this to us. You see, the mention of Roman persecution in verse 10 being connected and following the Jewish slander confirms historical reports of Jews that allied with the Romans and the Gentiles to oppress Christians. Let's do a little history. Some of you may not like this, but none of us like history, right? But we need to know what history is says so that we can learn from its example and not repeat the same mistakes. I want to give you just very quickly a few verses, or a few passages rather, in the book of Acts, which Acts tells the story of the early church. Christ ascended to heaven. Ten days later, the Holy Spirit came. The church was born. It started in Jerusalem. And ultimately, after persecution, the church scattered, and then it broke all the barriers. The gospel would go to Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, and then the uttermost parts of the earth. And you see that progression through the book of Acts. Look, if you will, or just write this down. Acts chapter 13, verse 45. I forget, uh, I'll have to look this up real quick because I didn't put what, uh, what community it is. I'll, I'll try to tell you that real fast. I'm flipping my pages here, but in Acts 13, as it traces the missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul, uh, we find here that Paul and Barnabas are in Antioch, okay? And here's what it says in Acts 13, verse 45. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what Paul was saying, in insulting him. Go down to verse 50. As a result of Paul preaching the gospel, the Jews incited the prominent God-fearing women and the leading men of the city, and they stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from the district. And quite frankly, that's what happened to Paul a lot in his ministry. He would go to a community. He would go to the Jews first, okay? He would preach the gospel. Some would believe, some wouldn't. And the ones that didn't many times would harden their opposition against him and run him out of town and then follow him to the next town. Look, if you will, in Acts 14. In Acts 14, uh, now he goes down the road to Iconium. And here's what it says in Acts 14, verse 1. In Iconium, they, meaning Paul and Barnabas, they entered the Jewish synagogue as usual, and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. That's positive. But, verse 2, the unbelieving Jews. Now please hear me. When I talk about the stuff that, that we don't want to see about Jews, I'm emphasizing unbelieving Jews. And right there in verse 2, you see the qualifier. I'm talking about unbelieving Jews. They say they're Jews, but according to Jesus, they're really not. They're a synagogue of Satan unbelieving Jews. The unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So they stayed there a long time. They spoke boldly for the Lord who testified to the message of his grace by enabling them to do signs and wonders. But the people of the city were divided some siding with the Jews and others with the apostles. And when an attempt was made by both the Jews and uh, the, I mean, let me read that again. When an attempt was made by both the Gentiles and Jews, 
with their rulers to mistreat and stone them. They found out about it, and they fled to Lyconian towns of Lystra and Derbe and to the surrounding countryside. And there they continued preaching the gospel. You go down to verse 19. There in Lystra, here's what it says. Uh, Acts 14, 19. Some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, the two previous towns that Paul had been in. They're still following him. And when they won over the crowds, they stoned Paul and they dragged him out of the city thinking he was dead. That was one of the lowest moments of Paul's ministry because he thought he was fixing to die. Okay? When you read the the little journal entry in 2 Corinthians where Paul goes uh, in detail about all the different things. He's been shipwrecked and he's been naked and he's been hungry and he's been in prison and he's been through this, that, and the other and he's been stoned and he's been beaten with rods. This is one of those moments, okay? This is where he was stoned. They took stones and rocks and threw it at him and he went down and they kept throwing at him and usually that, that kills somebody. But in God's mercy, he wasn't dead. They thought he was. Then you jump to Acts 17. Now in Acts 17, let's see where Paul is at now in his missionary journey. In Acts 17, the verse uh, 1, now he's in Thessalonica. And look what happens. Acts 17, verse 1. After they, that's Paul and his mission team, after they passed through Amphilius and Apollyana, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As usual, Paul went into the synagogue and on three Sabbath days reasoned with them from the Scriptures. Again, I want you to understand, Paul said in Romans, Paul said in 1 Corinthians, that the gospel is to the Jew first and to the Gentile. And I've pondered that many times, and I think I know why. If you skip the Jew and go to the Gentile, you've offended them, you'll never reach them. And even though Paul was the apostle to the Gentile and Peter was the apostle to the Jew, Paul still went to the Jew first. Every time he went to a community, he found a synagogue. Every time he went to a community, he went to the Jews first. Man, have I got news for you. And then if they rejected it, then he said, I'm going to the Gentiles. But he gave them first offer. He gave them the first opportunity. So he goes to the synagogue. Three Sabbath days, three weeks in a row. He reasons with them from the scriptures. Verse 3, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer and rise from the dead. And then he says, this Jesus that I'm proclaiming to you is the Messiah. You can't get any cut and dry than that, right? I mean, he makes it well known. You know, here's what our Old Testament says, and I'm here to tell you this Jesus from Nazareth, he was crucified, he rose from the dead on the third day, and he is your Messiah. There's no mincing words. There's no misunderstanding the message. In verse 4, some of them were persuaded, and they joined Paul and Silas, including a large number of God-fearing Greeks, as well as a number of the leading women. But the Jews became jealous, and they brought together some wicked men from the marketplace. They formed a mob, and they started a riot in the city. Wow, that's sounding like 2020, isn't it? Attacking Jason's house, they searched for them to bring them out to the public assembly. And when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city officials shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down, they've come here too. And Jason has welcomed them. And they're all acting contrary to (coughs) Caesar's decrees. You catch that? Slander them. They're not part of us. They're against Caesar. Do you see now when we read about the church in Smyrna how emperor worship and the slander from the unbelieving Jews is the perfect storm for persecution of believers? There it is. So let's read that again. They're acting contrary to Caesar's decrees. They're saying that there's another king. His name is Jesus. And the crowd and the city officials who heard these things were upset. And after taking a security bond from Jason and the others, they released them. 
Now, let me read one more passage of Scripture and we'll jump back to Revelation 2 and we'll wrap all this up. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, remember as we were reading those passages in the book of Acts, one of them was when Paul was in Thessalonica. He wasn't there very long because of the unbelieving Jews and he had to leave town. He wrote two letters to that congregation. It's 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. And those are rich letters, by the way. They talk more about the return of Christ than anything else in the New Testament almost. But in 1 Corinthians 2, I want you to see what Paul says about these unbelieving Jews that are persecuting Christians. And I want to qualify that. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14 through 16. Paul says, For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's churches in Christ Jesus that are in Judea, since you have also suffered the same things from people of your own country just as they did from the Jews. So Paul is making a parallel here. He's saying, In Judea, the churches there were persecuted by unbelieving Jews. And now you in Thessalonica are being persecuted by your own people that refuse to believe the gospel. And then he says this. He says, just as they did from the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and persecuted us. They displeased God and they're hostile to everyone by keeping us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. As a result, they are constantly filling up their sins to the limit and wrath has overtaken them at last. Again, I can't believe my ears and eyes when I read and hear this because I'm like, wow, this is coming from Paul the Apostle who before he knew Jesus, he was persecuting the followers of the way. He was rounding them up, putting them in prison, and applauding when they died. And then he gets radically saved, and now he's persecuted for the faith that he once tried to destroy. And yet he's got some really strong words for unbelieving Jews that try to do the same thing he did, which is destroy followers of Jesus. He's got some strong words. And this is coming from the pen of Paul. And Paul is saying, look, they killed the Lord Jesus. They killed the prophets. How did he know that? Well, he knew history. But he also remembered what, um, what um, oh, help me. The first Christian martyr in the book of Acts, Stephen. Thank you. It just went. <laughs> he remembered what Stephen said before he died. Stephen gave a little history lesson of, of what God had done with their people. And then he, he gets to the end of it. And he says, you all, you all always resist the Holy Spirit. And they covered their ears and they yelled and they ran to him and they stoned him. And that was it. End of story, end of sermon. And uh, Paul is right. They persecuted the prophets. They are the ones that handed Jesus over to the Romans and said, crucify him. And Paul is saying that hostility that blatant opposition, that, that unbelief from that particular group that is so opposed to stomping out this movement of the followers of Jesus, he says God's going to judge them. Coming from a man who's been there, done that. Now with that said, let's go back to Revelation 2 and we will finish this up. I felt like in this case you really needed some context to understand why in the world would Jesus talk to the church about unbelieving Jews who are slandering them, who say they're Jews and they're not, and call them a synagogue of Satan. My goodness. Well, I hope now, with our little tour, I hope now you know. So, Revelation 2.10, Christ says to the church in Smyrna, don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer. Now, there's only one way you can take that. You're fixing to suffer. <laughs> Rather than fret over something you can't stop or control, just don't be afraid when it happens because I'm with you. Don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer. Look, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison to test you 
and you will experience affliction for 10 days. Now, I'm not sure how to take 10 days. Revelation is the most symbolic book of the Bible. Whether it's symbolic or whether it's literal, let's just say it this way. It's short. 10 days is short compared to, my goodness, think about, think about COVID, okay? When that happened in March, you know what we all thought. I think all of us thought, okay, we're all going to quarantine for a couple weeks. This will blow over, and then we'll go back to living again. And now it's been what? Six months? Right? And there's still a lot of things we can't do and there's certain things we have to do and we're wondering how long this is going to go on. Is it going to is it going to go through the rest of this year? Is it going to be, it does, does it go into next year? Does it go through all of next year? Like, like how much longer, right? Ten days. Ten days. That's what God's word is to them. The devil's about to throw some of you into prison to test you, and you'll experience affliction for 10 days. Be faithful to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. Now, it's interesting here, because I know I've told you that I see some parallels between Revelation and the book of Daniel. And it's interesting that in the same sentence he talks about affliction for 10 days, he says it's going to test you. And it reminds me, quite honestly, it reminds me of Daniel chapter 1 when Daniel and his three friends were, were told this is the diet you have to follow by the king. And Daniel had convictions about idolatry. And uh, many times in those days, you know, food was, was, was used in idol worship, but they're not going to waste the food. And, and anyway, long story short, Daniel approached the person over him, not the king, but the person in, in, in the king's uh, authority. He goes to him and he says, do you mind if we don't drink the wine and don't eat the meat? Can we just have water and vegetables? And the guy's like, hey, you, you, I got to follow what the king says. You, you, you can't get me in trouble. What if I let you do that and you look pitiful, poor, and weak? Then... He's going to know, and I'm going to get in trouble. And so Daniel has a proposition. In Daniel 1, verse 12, here's what Daniel says to this servant. He, sees, he says, please test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. And then, after those 10 days, examine our appearance and the appearance of the young men who are eating the king's food and deal with your servants based on what you see. And so the guy said, deal. He agreed with them, and he tested them for 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, they looked better and healthier than all the young men who were eating the king's food. Just kind of reminds me of that. And so the bottom line is, just like Daniel and his friends were tested for 10 days, God, or Jesus, is saying to the church in Smyrna, don't be afraid of what's fixing to happen. You're going to be tested for 10 days. 10 days is not long. That's a drop in the bucket compared to, you know, our lifetime. Consider it a test. Don't be afraid. Be faithful. Even to the point of death. And here's where I want to mention that in verse 8, when Jesus opens the letter, thus says the first and the last, the one who was dead and came to life, the self-description of Christ as the first and the last is taken from God's own self-description in Isaiah 41, 44, and 48. And in the context of, of Isaiah 41 and 44, God commands the Israelites, don't be afraid. The same command he now gives to the church in Smyrna. So let me wrap this up. Jesus is writing, uh, he's telling uh, John to write a letter to the church in Smyrna. The character of Christ is the one who is the first and the last, the one who was dead but has come to life. He tells them they're spiritually rich. Okay, They might be materially poor, and they might be going through a lot of affliction and hard times and suffering, but they're spiritually rich. He does not rebuke them of any sin 
or any problem. The only one, I might add, out of the seven. And then the duty they have is to suffer for Christ. Don't be afraid of what's going to happen to you. Be faithful even unto death. And the promise, let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches, the one who conquers will never be harmed by the second death. Even if you die for Christ, you'll never die again. Born twice, die once. Born once, die twice. The application is very to the point tonight. Be faithful, not fearful, when you face persecution and possible death for the name of Jesus. And quite frankly, if you never thought that could happen in good old United States of America, I hope 2020 wakes you up. It can happen anywhere, even here. God forbid if it does, I hope it never does, but it can happen anywhere. Romans 8.18, Paul said, For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that's going to be revealed to us. That's the outlook. That's the attitude you have to have. No matter what, happened to, what, no matter what happens to me here and now, may I be faithful to Christ. May I pass the test. And think about the glory that's going to be revealed. On the other side. My challenge to you tonight. And I say this. Basically. Not only to summarize the lesson. But if you heard. Uh, if you heard in the news lately. After 50 years of ministry. Brother Charles Stanley. Is now finally stepping down. From First Baptist Atlanta. He's pastor emeritus. Or whatever that little title is. And uh, he's still going to continue his ministry through In Touch. But he is, his, his tenure at First Baptist, they've, they've had a plan for the past three or four years, and he says it's time. Brother Charles Stanley always said this, and this is my challenge to you. Will you resolve to be faithful to Christ no matter the cost or the consequences? The way he would say it is obey God and leave the consequences to him. Are you willing, are you willing to be faithful to Christ no matter the cost or the consequences? That's the lesson we get from the church at Smyrna. Let's pray. Father, we come before you tonight. Thank you for this time and the word. Father, I pray that you would just encourage us and strengthen us. Help us, Lord, to be faithful to you no matter what happens in this world, no matter what happens in our life. Lord, we know that no matter what we go through now, it doesn't even begin to compare to the glory that we will experience on the other side. Lord, we love you and we praise you and we thank you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right.